Section 22 of From Pole to Pole by Sven Heden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 22. In the South Seas. Albatrosses and Whales. Like the sting on the scorpion's poison gland, Tierra del Fuego, the most southern land of America, juts out into the southern sea. It is separated from the mainland by the sound which bears the name of the intrepid Magellan. In the primeval forests of the interior grow evergreen beaches, and there copper-brown Indians of the Ona tribe formerly held unlimited sway. Like their brethren all over the New World, they have been thrust out by white men and are doomed to extinction. They were but sojourners on the coasts of Tierra del Fuego, and their term has expired. Only a few now remain, but they still retain the old characteristics of the race. They are powerfully built, warlike and brave, live at feud with their neighbors, and kindle their campfires in the woods, on the shores of lakes, or in the coasts. Many a sailing vessel has come to grief in the Straits of Magellan. The channel is dangerous, and has a bad reputation for violent squalls, which beat down suddenly over the precipitous cliffs. It is safer to keep to the open sea and sail to the south of the islands of Tierra del Fuego. Here the surges of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans roar together against the high cliffs of Cape Horn. Who listens to this song? Who gazes with royal disdain down over the spray? Who wonders why the breakers have been there for thousands of years, pounding against gates that never open? Who soars at this moment with outspread wings over Cape Horn? Who but the albatross, the largest of all storm birds, the boldest and most unwearied of all the winged inhabitants of the realm of the air? Look at him well, for in a second he will be gone. You see that he is as large as a swan, has a short thick neck, a large head with a powerful pink and yellowish bill, and that he is quite white except where his wing feathers are black. His wings are wonders of creation. When he folds them, they cling close to the body and seem to disappear. But now he has them spread out, and they measure twelve feet from tip to tip. They are long and narrow, thin and finely formed as a sword blade. He moves them with amazing steadiness and excels all other birds in strength and endurance. No bird has such an elegant and majestic flight. He spreads his wings like sails with taut sheets and soars at a whistling pace up against the wind. Follow him with your eyes hour after hour in the hardest wind and you will see that he makes scarcely perceptible beat of his wings only every seventh minute, keeping them between whiles perfectly still. That is his secret. All his skill consists in his manner of holding the wings expanded and the inclination he gives to his excellent monoplane in relation to his body and the wind. Everything else, change of elevation and movements forward with or against the wind, is managed by the wind itself. When he wishes to rise from the surface of the sea, he spreads his wings, turns toward the wind, and lets it lift him up. Then he soars in elegant curves and glides up the invisible hills of the atmosphere. Most noteworthy is the perfect freedom of the albatross. He shuns the mainland and breeds on solitary islands. He can scarcely move on the ground, and when he is forced to alight, he waddles clumsily along like a swan. He comes in contact with the earth only at the nest, where the hen sits on her single egg and tucks her white head under her wing. Otherwise, he does not touch the ground. He finds his food on the surface of the sea and spends three-fourths of his life in the air. There he soars about from sea to sea like a satellite to the earth, moving freely and lightly round the heavy globe as it rolls through space. He is not restricted to any particular course. No distance is too great for him. He simply rests on his wings and sweeps easily from ocean to ocean. He is, however, rarer in the Atlantic than in the Pacific Ocean, and he avoids the heat of the equatorial regions. He sails in any other direction he pleases, where he has the most prospect of satisfying his voracious appetite. 
What do you think of an albatross which was caught on a vessel and marked so that it might be recognized again, and which then followed the vessel for six days and nights, watching for any refuse thrown out? The ship was in the open sea and was sailing twelve knots an hour, but the albatross did not tire. Nay, he made circles of miles round the vessel at a considerable height. On board the ship, the watch was changed time after time, for man must rest and sleep, but the albatross needed neither sleep nor rest. He had no one to whom he could entrust the management of his wings while he slept at night. He kept awake for a week without showing any signs of weariness. He flew on and on, sometimes disappearing astern, and an hour later reappearing again and sweeping down on the vessel from the front. That it was the same albatross was proved by the mark painted on the breast. Only on the seventh day did he leave the ship dissatisfied with the fare set before him. He was then hundreds of miles from the nearest coast. Just think of all the wonderful and remarkable sights he must witness on his airy course. He sees everything that takes place on the decks of large sailing vessels and the smoke rising out of steamers funnels. He marks the clumsy movements of the 20 feet long sea elephants on the gravel shore of the islands of South Georgia, east of Cape Horn, and sees the black or gray backs of whales rolling on the surface of the water. Perhaps he has some time wandered away northwards over the Atlantic and seen whalers attack the blue whale, the largest animal now living in the world, for it often attains a length of 90 feet. At the present day, whalers use strongly built, swift, and easily handled steam launches and shoot the harpoon out from the bow with a pivoted gun. In the head of the harpoon is a pointed shell which explodes in the body of the whale, dealing a mortal wound, and at the butt end a thick rope is secured. The vessel follows the whale until it is dead. Then it is hauled up with a steam winch and towed to a whaling station in some bay on the coast where it is flitched. Then the oil is boiled out, poured into casks, and sent to market. Much more picturesque and more dangerous was the whaling witnessed in northern seas by the forefathers of the albatross, for man has been for a thousand years the worst enemy of the whale, and some species are almost exterminated. Then the whalers did not use a gun, but threw the harpoon by hand. Every vessel had several keelless whale boats pointed at both bow and stern so that they could be rowed forwards or backwards. When a whale was seen in the distance, the boat set out, each boat manned by six experienced whalers. One of them was the coxswain, another the harpooner, while the others sat at the oars. The harpoon line, an inch thick, lay carefully coiled up and ran out through a brass eye in the bow. Every man knew from long experience what he had to do at any particular minute, and therefore there was silence on board, all working without orders. When all is ready, one of the boats rows toward the whale, and the harpooner throws his sharp weapon with all his strength into the whale's flank. Almost before the harpoon has struck, the boat is backed swiftly. Wild with pain, the whale may strike the boat from above with his powerful horizontal caudal fin and crush it at a blow, or he may dive below the boat and upset it, but usually he thinks only of making his escape. He makes for the depths in fright, and the harpoon line runs out, the strands producing a singing sound. Great care is necessary, for if the line curls round a man's leg, he is carried overboard and is lost. The whale dives at once to a depth of a couple hundred fathoms. There it is dark and quiet, and he remains there half an hour or more, till at length he is obliged to come up to breathe. The lie of the line in the water shows approximately where he will come up again, and another boat rows to that spot. As soon as he appears above the surface, a second harpoon whistles through the air. The whale is now too breathless to dive. He swims along the surface and lashes the waves with his tail to free himself from his tormentors. He speeds along at a desperate pace, dashing the waves into spray around him and drawing the boats after him. The crews have hauled in the lines, and the boats are quite close to the whale, but they must be ready to pay out the lines if the whale dives. 
The boat's prows are tilted high up into the air, and the water streams off them. They shoot forward like mad things through the foaming sea, whether it be day or night, and pitch up or down over the crest of the waves. With stretched muscles, clenched teeth, and glaring eyes, the whale hunters follow the movements of the whale and the boat. They notice that the pace slackens. The whale begins to tire, and at last is quite exhausted. Its movements become irregular. It stops and throws itself about so that the water spurts up all around it. Then a boat rows up, and a long spear is thrust in three feet deep towards the animal's heart, and perhaps an explosive bullet is fired. If the lungs are pierced, the whale sends up jets of blood from its nostrils, hoisting the red flag in the language of whalers. Its time has come. It gives up the struggle, and its death tremors show that another of the giants of the ocean has bid a last farewell to its boundless realm. Robinson Crusoe's Island On motionless wings, an albatross hovers high above Cape Horn. His sharp eye takes in everything. Now he sees in the distance smoke from the funnel of a steamer, and in a couple of minutes he has tacked round the vessel and decided to follow it on its voyage to the north. To the east he has the coast of Chile, with its countless reefs and islands and deep fjords, and above it rises the snow-capped crest of the Andes. As soon as refuse is thrown overboard, the albatross swoops down like an arrow. A second before he touches the water, he raises his wings, draws back his head, stretches out his large feet in front with expanded claws, and then plumps down, screaming into the water. He floats as lightly as a cork. In a moment, he has swallowed all the scraps floating on the surface, and then, turning to the wind, rises to a giddy height. The vessel happens to be carrying goods to Santiago, the capital of Chile, and casts anchor at its port town, Valparaiso. In the background rises Aconcagua, the highest mountain of America. Then the albatross steers out to sea to try his luck elsewhere. Seventy miles from the coast, he comes across the notable little island Juan Fernandez and circles around its volcanic cliffs. For him, there are no frightful, precipitous ascents and descents. From his height, he can see all he wishes to see. It is otherwise with explorers. Some cliffs are inaccessible to their feet, as Carl Scottsberg found when he went out to the island three years ago in a Chilean vessel. He saw the cliffs 3,000 feet high and heard the surf rolling in round the island. It was a perfect picture of wild desolation. He found it difficult to land in a small boat. He looked in vain for parrots, monkeys, and tortoises, but found instead that more than half the number of plants on the island are such as grow on no other spot on the earth. Among them are palms with bright, pale green trunks, which have been recklessly destroyed by men to make walking sticks. Here also are tree ferns and the small, delicate climbing ferns which gracefully festoon trunks and boughs. And here also is the last specimen of a species of sandalwood, which, wonderful to relate, has found its way hither from its home in Asia. A couple of hundred years ago, it grew profusely on the island, but now it has been nearly exterminated by man's cupidity. The red, strongly scented wood was too much in demand for fine cabinet work and other purposes. Only one small branch now produces foliage on the last sandal tree. In this case, it is not the last tree among many, but the last specimen of a species which is vanishing from the earth. In a cave at the foot of a mountain, according to tradition, lived Robinson Crusoe, and from a saddle in the crest he threw longing, eager glances over the great ocean. A memorial tablet in the cave relates that the real Crusoe, a Scotch sailor named Selkirk, lived alone on the island for four years and four months in the years 1704 to 1709. He went on shore of his own accord, being dissatisfied with the officers of the ship to which he belonged. The climate was mild, the rainfall moderate, and wild goats and edible fruits served him for food. Such is the actual fact. How much more do we delight in the Robinson Crusoe whose story is so charmingly depicted in romantic dress? His vessel foundered, 
and he was the only man who was thrown up by the stormy waves upon the island. There he made himself a home, wandered round the shore and through the woods, and filled his shooting bag of banana leaves with oysters, turtle eggs, and wild fruits. With his simple bow, he shot the animals of the forest to make himself clothes of their skins, and wild goats, which he caught and tamed, yielded him milk, from which he turned butter and manufactured cheese. He became a fisherman, furrier, and potter, and on the height above his cave he had his chapel, where he kept Sundays. He found wild maize, and sowed, reaped, and made bread. As years passed, his prosperity increased, and he was a type of the whole human race, from which the rude simplicity of the savage has, in the course of ages, progressed to a condition of refinement and enlightenment. When he was most at a loss for fire to prepare his food, the lightning struck a tree and set it on fire, and we remember that he then kept up his fire for a long time, never letting it go out. He was very grieved when at length it expired, but a volcanic outbreak came to his assistance, and he lighted his fire again from the glowing lava. He made himself a bread oven of bricks, and built himself a hut and a boat. Once, when he was away on an excursion, and lay asleep far from his dwelling, he started up in alarm at hearing someone call out his name. It was only his own parrot which had learned to talk, and which had searched for him and was sitting on a bough calling out, Poor Robinson Crusoe! How well we remember his lonely walk to the other side of the island, when he stood petrified with fear before the print of a human foot in the sand. For eight years he had been alone, and now he found that there were other human beings, cannibals, no doubt, in the neighborhood. He stood, gazed, listened, hurried home, and prepared for defense. Here also he is a type of peoples and states, which sooner or later awake to a perception of the necessity of defense against hostile attacks. His suspicions gave way to certainty when one day he sees a fire burning on the beach. He runs home, draws up the ladder over the fortification round his dwelling, makes ready his weapons, climbs up to his lookout, and sees ten naked savages roasting flesh round a fire. After a wild dance, they push out their canoes and disappear. At the fire are left gnawed human bones and skulls, and Robinson is beside himself at the sight. At the end of the fourteenth year, he is awakened one stormy night by a shot. His heart beats fast, for now the hour of deliverance is surely at hand. Another shot thunders through the night. Perhaps it is a signal of distress from a ship. He lights a huge fire to guide the crew. When morning dawns, he finds that a ship has run on to a submerged rock and been wrecked. No sign of the crew is visible. But, yes, a sailor lies prostrate on the sand, and a dog howls beside him. Crusoe runs up. He would like a companion in his loneliness. But, however long he works with artificial respiration and other remedies, the dead will not come to life, and Robinson Crusoe sadly digs a grave for the unknown guest. Another year passes, and all the days are alike. As he sits at his table breaking his bread and eating fish and oysters, he has his dog, parrot, and goats as companions, and gives them a share of his meal. One day he sees from his lookout hill five boats come to the island and put to shore, and thirty savages jump on land and light a fire. Then they bring two prisoners from the boat. One they kill with a club. The other runs away and makes straight toward Crusoe's dwelling. Only two men pursue him, and Crusoe runs up to help him. At a sign from his master, the dog rushes on one of the savages and holds him fast till he gets his death blow, and the other meets the same fate. Then Crusoe, by signs and kindly gestures, makes the prisoner understand that he had found a friend. The poor fellow utters some incomprehensible words, and Crusoe, who has not heard a human voice for fifteen years, is delighted to hear him speak. The other savages make off as fast as they can. Robinson Crusoe's black friend receives the name of Friday because he came to the island on a Friday. In time, Friday learns to speak and brightens and relieves the life of the solitary man. 
One day another wreck is stranded on the rocks, and Robinson and Friday fetch from its stores firearms and powder, tools and provisions, and many other useful things. When eighteen long years have expired, the hero of our childhood is rescued by an English ship. Across the Pacific Ocean The albatross is a knowing bird, or he would not follow vessels for weeks. He knows that there is food on board, and that edible fragments are often thrown out. But his power of observation and his knowledge are much greater than might be suspected. He knows also of old where small storm birds take their prey, and when he finds them flying along with their catch, he shoots down like lightning among them, appropriates all he can find, and does not trouble himself in the least about the smaller bird's disappointment. But these vultures of the sea are still cleverer in other ways. Their forefathers have lived on the sea for thousands of years, and their senses have been developed to the greatest acuteness and perfection. They know the regular winds and can perceive from the color of the water if a cold or warm sea current sweeps along below them. If now our friend the albatross, traveling westwards over the islands of Polynesia, wishes to be carried along by the wind, he knows that he has only to keep between the Tropic of Capricorn and the equator in order to be in the belt of the southeast trade winds. And, no doubt, he has noticed that this wind gives rise to the equatorial current, which, broad and strong, sets westward across the Pacific Ocean. If he wishes to fly north of the equator, he receives the same help from the northeast trade wind, but if he wanders far to the south or north of the equator, he will meet with headwinds and find that the ocean current sets eastwards. In the northern half of the Pacific Ocean, this northeasterly current is called the Kuroshiwo, or black salt. It skirts the coast of Japan and runs right across to Canada. This current is one of the favorite haunts of the albatross. He knows further that the arrangement of winds and currents is just the same in the Atlantic. There, however, the current running northeast is called the Gulf Stream, and it is the warm water of this stream, coming from the equator, which makes the climate of northwestern Europe so mild, and prevents even the northernmost fjords of Norway from freezing in winter. Meanwhile, the albatross is on its course westwards, careless of winds and currents. He heeds not the hardest storm, and indeed, where could he hide himself from its violence? His dwelling is the air. The sea is high, and he skims just above the surface, rising to meet each wave and descending into every trough, and the tips of his wings seem to dip into the foam. The great ocean seems dreadfully dreary and deserted. The sun glistens on the spindrift, and the albatross is reflected in the smooth, bright roof of waves above the fairy crystal grottoes in the depths. He rises to see whether the island he is thinking about is visible above the horizon. Beneath him he sees the dark, white-tipped, roaring sea. From the west, bluish-black rain clouds sweep up and open their sluice gates. Is the albatross hindered in his flight by the rain which pelts violently down on his back and wings? Well, yes, he must certainly be delayed, but he can foretell the weather with enough certainty to keep clear, and he is swift enough on the wing to make his escape when overtaken by rain. And he can always descend, fold his pinions, and rest, dancing on the waves. The rain over, he flies higher up again and now sees Easter Island, which from an immense depth rises above the water, terribly lonely in the great ocean. On the sloping beach, he sees several monuments of stone, 30 feet high, in the form of human heads. They mark graves and are memorials of a long-vanished settlement. Now there are only about 150 natives on Easter Island, and even these are doomed to extinction. Three white men live on the island, but it is long since news was heard of them, for no vessel is touched there for several years. Of other living things, only rats, goats, fowls, and seabirds exist on the island. At some distance to the northeast lies Sala y Gomez, a small island of perfectly bare rocks, only inhabited by sea fowl, and there the albatross pays a passing visit. Now he rises again and continues his flight westward. Soon he comes to a swarm of insignificant islands called the Low Archipelago. 
so we name the islands, but the dark-skinned natives who by some mysterious fortune have been banished to them call them Paomotu, or Island Cloud. A poet could not have conceived a better name. There lie eighty-five groups of islands, each consisting of innumerable homes. They are really clouds of islets, like a nebula or star mist in the sky, and this swarm is only one among many others studying all the western part of the Pacific Ocean. Now the albatross soars round the rocks of the island cloud. He can see them easily from up above, but it is a harder matter for a vessel to make its way between the treacherous rocks and reefs. Though they are so many, the aggregate area amounts to less than four square miles. Almost all are formed of coral, and most of them are atolls. Reef-building corals are small animals which extract lime from the water. They multiply by budding, and every group forms a common clan where living and dead numbers rest side by side. Coral onomacula depend for their existence on a firm, hard sea bottom, crystal clear water, sufficient nutriment brought to them by waves and currents, and lastly, a water temperature not falling below 68 degrees. Therefore, they occur only in tropical seas and near the surface, for the water becomes colder with the depth. At depths greater than 160 feet, they are rare. They die and increase again and again, and therefore the coral reefs grow in height and breadth, and only the height of water at ebb tide puts a limit to their upward growth. The continual surf of the sea and stormy waves often break off whole blocks of coral limestone, which roll down and break up into sand. With this, all cavities are filled in, and thus the action of the sea helps to consolidate and strengthen the reef. Other lime-extracting animacula and also seaweeds establish themselves on the reef. In the course of time, the waves throw up loose blocks on top of the reef, so the parts of it are always above the water level. When the water rises during flood tide, white foaming surf indicates the position of the reef at a long distance. During the ebb, the reef itself is exposed and the sea is quiet. Between ebb and flood, the fairway is dangerous, for there is nothing to warn a vessel, and it may run right on to a coral reef and be lost. Reefs have various forms and lengths. The Great Barrier Reef, which lies off the northeast coast of Australia, is 1,200 miles long. When reefs form circles, they are called atolls. By means of wind, birds, and ocean current, Seeds are carried about the ocean and strike root on any part of the reef which lies above the level of the flood tide. In the fullness of time, the atoll is completed, built up by animacula and plants. The island cloud is the largest continual atoll region in the world. There, the circular coral islands lie like a collection of garlands thrown down upon the sea. Within them, the water may be as much as 230 feet deep and in the lagoons of some atolls, all the fleets of the world could find room. The minute coral animacula have provided by their industrious labor shelter for the largest vessels. On many of the atolls grow cocoa palms, and only then are the ring-shaped islands inhabitable. How curious they look to one approaching on a vessel. Only the crowns of the palms are seen above the horizon. The island, being low, is out of sight one might be coming to an oasis in the boundless Sahara. At last, the solid coral ground of the island comes into sight. Breakers dash on the outer side of the ring, but the lagoon within is as smooth as a mirror in the lee of the corals and palms. Four thousand natives of Polynesian race live on the homes of the island cloud, a couple of hundred on each atoll. They gather pearls and mother-of-pearl and barter them for European goods at a ridiculously low price. On some islands, breadfruit trees, pineapples, and bananas are grown. Animal life is very poor, rats, parrots, pigeons, thrushes, and lizards, but all the richer is the life in the sea outside. The natives are most excellent seamen, and it is hard to believe that they are lifelong prisoners on their islands. They sail with sails of matting made by women and have outriggers which give stability to their boats, and they cross boldly from island to island. 
What does the albatross care if the French have hoisted their tricolored flag over the atolls of the island cloud and their nearest neighbors to the west? He is absolute ruler over them all, and seizes his prey where he will. Now he makes for the Society Islands and takes a circuit around the largest of them, Tahiti, the finest and best known of all the islands in the southern sea. There again he sees volcanoes long since extinct, grand wild cliffs thickly covered with wood, impenetrable clumps of ferns and luxuriant grass, while down the slopes dance lively brooks to the lagoons separated from the sea by breakwaters of the coral master builders. On the strand grow the ever-present coca palms, as distinctive of the islands of the southern sea as the date palms are of the desert regions of the old world. Here the weather is beautiful, a warm, equable, tropical sea climate with only three or four degrees difference between winter and summer. The southeast trade wind blows all year round, and storms are rare visitors. The rain is moderate, and fever is unknown. The natives take a bright and happy view of life. They deck their hair with wreaths of flowers, their gait is light and easy, and they knew no sorrow until a white man came and spoiled their life and liberty. Now the original inhabitants of Tahiti are dying out and are being replaced by Chinamen, Europeans, and natives from other islands to the northwest. They still, however, till their fields, put out their fishing canoes in the lagoon, and pull down coconuts in their season. They still wear wreaths of flowers in their hair, a last relic of a happier existence. Pigeons coo in the trees, and green and blue and white parrots utter their ear-piercing screams. Horses, cattle, sheep, goats, and swine are newcomers. Lizards, scorpions, flies, and mosquitoes are indigenous. The luxuriant gardens, with their natural charms, Europeans have not been able to destroy, and the frigate bird, the eagle of the sea, with the tail feathers of which the chiefs of Tahiti used to decorate their heads, still roosts in the trees on that strand, and seeks its food far out in the sea. The albatross cannot but notice the frigate bird. He sees in him a rival. The latter does not make such long journeys, and does not venture so far out to sea, but he is a master in the art of flying, and he is an unconscionable thief. He follows dolphins and other fishes of prey to appropriate their catch, and forces other birds to relinquish their food when they are in the act of swallowing it. When fishermen are out drawing up their nets, he skims so low over the boat that he may be stunned with an oar, and he is so attracted by bright and gaudy colors that he will shoot down recklessly onto the pennants of ships as they flutter in the wind, swinging to and fro with the roll of the vessel. He soars to an immense height, like the eagle, and no telescope can match the sharpness of his eyesight. Up aloft, he can see the smallest fish disporting itself on the surface of the water. Especially, he looks out for flying fish, and catches them in the air just as they are hovering on expanded fins above the waves, or else dives after them and seizes them down below. When he has caught a fish, he soars aloft, and if the fish does not lie comfortably in his bill, he drops it and catches it again before it reaches the water, and he will do this repeatedly until the fish is in a convenient position for swallowing. Our far-traveled storm bird continues his long journey westward, and his next resting place is the Samoa Islands, which he recognizes by their lofty volcanic cliffs, their tuff and lava, their beautiful woods and waterfalls as much as 650 feet high, and surrounded by the most luxuriant vegetation. Over the copses of ferns and climbing plants and shrubs reminding one of India flutter beautiful butterflies. Around their oval huts, with roof of sugarcane leaves and the floor inside covered with cocoa mats, are seen the yellowish-brown Polynesians, of powerful build and proud bearing. The upper parts of their bodies are bare, and they wear necklaces of shells and teeth, deck themselves with flowers and feathers, smear their bodies with cocoa oil, and tattoo themselves. Of a peaceful and happy disposition, they too have been disturbed by white men, and have been forced to cede their islands to Germany and the United States. It rains abundantly on the Samoa Islands. 
black clouds sink down toward the sea violent water spouts suck up the water in spiral columns which spread out above like crowns of pine trees and deluges of rain come down lasting sometimes for weeks everything becomes wet and sodden and it is useless to try to light a fire with matches almost every year these islands are visited by sudden whirlwinds which do great damage both on sea and land wreckage is thrown up on the shore field and plantations are destroyed leaves fly like feathers from the cocoa palms and if the storm is one of the worst kind the trees themselves fall in long rows as if they had been mown down by a gigantic scythe the albatross knows of old the course of the great steamboat liners he sees several steamers at the samoa islands and afterwards on his flight to the fiji islands and if the weather is overcast and stormy he leaves his fishing grounds in the great ocean deserts and makes for some well-known steamer route for in stormy weather he can find no soft cephalopods but from a vessel refuse is thrown out in all weathers he knows that the samoa islands are in regular communication with the sandwich islands and that from these navigation routes radiate out like a star to asia america and australia he sails proudly past the fiji islands he does not trouble himself to make an excursion to the solomon islands and the world of islands lying like piers of fallen bridges on the way to the coast of asia though new caledonia is so near to the west he is not attracted to it as the french use it as a penal settlement rather will he trim his wings for the south and soon he sees the mountains of the northern island of new zealand rise above the horizon among them stands tongariro's active volcano with its seven craters and northeast of it lies the crater lake taupo among cliffs of pumice stone north of this lake are many smaller ones round which steam rises from hot springs and where many fine geysers shoot up playing like fountains he sees that on the southern island the mountains skirt the western coast just as in scandinavia that mighty glaciers descend from the eternal snowfields and that their streams lose themselves in mostly beautiful alpine lakes he gives a passing glance at the lofty mountain named after the great navigator cook which is twelve thousand three hundred sixty feet high on the plains and slopes shepherds tend immense flocks of sheep the woods are evergreen in the north grow pines whose trunks form long avenues and whose crowns are like vaultings in a venerable cathedral there grow beeches and tree ferns and climbing plants but the palms come to an end halfway down the southern island for the southernmost part of the island is too cold for them formerly both islands were inhabited by maoris they tattooed the whole of their bodies in fine and tasteful patterns but were cannibals and stuck their enemies' heads on poles round their villages. Now there are only 40,000 of them left, and even these are doomed to extinction through white men, as in the struggle between the brown and black rats. Formerly the Maoris stalked about with their war clubs over their shoulders. Now they work as day laborers in the service of the whites. At last our albatross rises high above the coast and speeds swiftly southward to the small island of Auckland. There he meets his mate, and for several days they are terribly busy in making ready their nest. They collect reeds, rushes, and dry grass, which they net into a kind of a high round ball. The month of November has come, and the summer has begun. In the southern hemisphere, midsummer comes at Christmas and midwinter at the end of June. Then the albatrosses assemble in enormous flocks at Auckland and other small, lonely islands to breed. Across Australia There are still districts in the interior of the fifth continent which have never been visited by Europeans. There stretch vast, sandy deserts, and the country is very dry, for the rain of the southeast trade wind falls on the mountain ranges to the east, where also the rivers flow. Fifty years ago, very little was known of the interior of Australia, and a large reward was offered to the man who should first cross the continent from sea to sea. Accordingly, a big expedition was set on foot. It was equipped by the colony of Victoria, 
large sums of money were contributed, and Robert Burke was chosen as leader. He was a bold and energetic man, but wanting in cool-headedness and the quiet, sure judgment necessary to conduct an expedition through unknown and desolate country. Two dozen camels with their drivers were procured from northwest India, provisions were obtained for a year, and all the articles purchased, even to the smallest trifles, were of the best quality money could buy. With such an equipment, all Australia might have been explored little by little. When the expedition set out from Melbourne, the capital of Victoria, there was great enthusiasm. Many people came out really to look at the camels, for they had never seen this animal before, but most of them looked forward to a triumph in geographical exploration. Burke was not alone. He had as many as 15 Europeans with him. Some of them were men of science who were to investigate the peculiar vegetation of the country, the singular marsupials, the character of the rocks, the climate, and so on. One of them was named Wills. Others were servants and had to look after horses and transport. The caravan started on August 20th, 1860. That was the first mistake, for the heat and drought were then setting in. The men marched on, undismayed, however, crossing Australia's largest river, the Murray, and came to its tributary, the Darling. There a permanent camp was pitched, and the larger part of the caravan was left there. Burke, Wills, and six other Europeans went on with five horses and sixteen camels toward the northwest, and in twenty-one days reached the River Cooper, which runs into Lake Eyre. Here another camp was set up. Several excursions were made in the neighborhood, and a messenger was sent to the Darling to hurry up the men left behind. The messenger loitered, however. One week passed after another, and when nothing was heard of the men, Burke decided to march northwards with only three companions, Wills and the two servants King and Gray, six camels, two horses, and provisions for three months, and cross the continent to the coast of Queensland on the Gulf of Carpinteria. The other four were to remain with horses and camels where they were until Burke came back, and were to leave the place only if absolutely obliged to do so. All went well at first, but the country was troublesome and rough, wild and undulating. As long as the explorers followed the sandy bed of the Cooper River, they found pools of water in sufficient numbers. At midday, the temperature in the shade was 97 degrees, but it fell at night to 73 degrees when they felt quite cold. Then they passed from bed to bed of temporary streams carrying water only in the rainy season, and there the usual pools of water remained in the shade of dense copses of grass trees, boxwood, and gum trees or eucalyptus. The last named were evidently not of the same species as the world-renowned blue gum tree which occurs in Victoria and Tasmania, for this dries up marshes and unhealthy tracts and grows to a height of 65 feet in seven years. But the giant gum tree is still more remarkable, for it attains a height of over 400 feet, and another species of eucalyptus has reached 500 feet. The party had also to cross dreary plains of sand and tracts of clay cracked by the drought, and there they had to have their leather sacks filled with water. Sometimes they saw flocks of pigeons flying northwards and were sure of finding water soon if they followed in the same direction. At some places there had been rain, so that a little grass had sprung up. In others the salt bushes were perishing from drought. The animal life was very scanty. In the brief notes of the expedition, few forms are mentioned except pigeons and ducks, wild geese, pelicans, and certain other waders, parrots, snakes, fishes, and rats. They saw no kangaroos, those curious jumping and springing animals which carry their young for seven months in a pouch on the belly and are as peculiar to Australia as the llama to South America. Nor do travelers speak of dingoes, the wild dogs of Australia, which are a terror to sheep farmers. They saw Australian blacks clad with shields, long spears, and boomerangs, and nothing else. These naked, low-type savages sometimes gave them fish in exchange for beads, matches, and other trifles. They were active as monkeys in the trees when they were hunting the beasts of the forest, but when they saw the camels, they usually took to their heels. 
They had never seen such kangaroos before with long legs both back and front, and also humpbacked. After the travelers had crossed a hilly tract, they had not far to go to the coast. From the last camp, Burke and Wills marched through swamps and woods of palm and mangroves, but they never caught sight of the waters of the Gulf of Carpinteria. Forests hid them, and swamps intervened when they were quite close to the shore. Burke had attained his aim, he had crossed Australia, but his exploit was of little use or satisfaction, least of all to himself, for his return was a succession of disasters, the most terrible journey ever undertaken in the fifth continent. Thunder, lightning, and deluges of rain marked the start southwards. The lightning flashes followed one another so closely that the palms and gum trees were lighted up in the middle of the night as in the day. The ground was turned into a continuous swamp. In order to spare the camels, the tents had been left behind. Everything became moist, and the men grew languid, and when the rain ceased, drought set in again in the oppressive, suffocating heat, so that they longed for night as for a friend. An emaciated horse was left behind. A snake eight feet long was killed, and following the example of the savages, they ate its flesh, but were sick after it. Once, when they were encamping in a cave in the valley, a downpour of rain came, filled the valley, and threatened to carry away themselves in their camp. Mosquitoes tormented them, and sometimes they had to lose a day when the ground was turned into a slough by the rain. One man sickened and died, but on April 21st, the three men were in sight of the camp where their comrades had been ordered to await their return. Burke thought that he could see them in the distance. How eager they were to get there! Here they would find all necessaries, and above all would be saved from starvation, which had already carried off one of the four. But the spot was deserted. Not a living thing remained. There were only on a tree trunk the words, Dig, April 21st. They digged and found a letter telling them that their comrades had left the place the same day, only a few hours before. Fortunately, they found also a supply of flour, rice, sugar, and dried meat enough to last them until they reached a station inhabited by whites. But where were the clothes to replace their worn rags, which would scarcely hang together on their bodies? After four months of hard traveling and constant privations, they were so overcome by weariness that every step was an effort, and now they had come to the camp only to find that their comrades had gone off the same day, neglecting their duty. Fate could not have treated them more cruelly. Burke asked Wills and King whether they thought they could overtake their comrades, but both answered no. Their last two camels were worn out, whereas the animals of the other men were, according to the letter, in excellent condition. A sensible man would have tried to reach them, or at least have followed their trail, and this Wills and King wanted to do, but Burke proposed a more westerly route, which he expected would be better and safer, and which led to the town of Adelaide in South Australia. It ran past Mount Hopeless, an unlucky name. All went well at first, as long as they had flour and rice and could obtain from the natives fish and nardu, ground seeds from the clover fern. They even ate rats, roasting them whole on the embers, skin and all, and found them well flavored. One camel died, and the other soon refused to move. He supplied them with a store of meat. But their provisions came to an end, and what was worse, water ceased on the way to Mount Hopeless. Then they decided to return to the abandoned camp. On the way, they kept alive on fish, which they sometimes procured from natives, having nothing else but nardu seeds plucked from the clover fern. Half dead with hunger and weariness, they came back to camp. Midwinter, the end of June, was come, and the nights were cold. It was decided that Burke and King should go out and look for natives. Wills was unable to go with them and was given a small supply of seeds and water. After two days of slow traveling, Burke could go no farther. King shot a crow, which they ate, but Burke's strength was exhausted. One evening he said to his servant, 
I hope that you will remain with me until I am really dead, then leave me without burying me. Next morning he was dead. Then King hurried back to Wills and found him dead also. The last words he had entered four days before in his journal were, Can live four or five days longer at most, if it keeps warm. Pulse 48, very weak. When the travelers were not heard of, the worst fears were entertained, and relief expeditions were dispatched from Melbourne, Adelaide, and Brisbane, and in Sydney and other towns Burke's fate was discussed with anxiety. At length they found King, who had gained the confidence of the natives, and had sojourned with them for two months, living as they did. He was unrecognizable and half out of his mind, but he recovered under the careful treatment he received. The two dead men were buried, Burke wrapped in the Union Jack. Later on, his remains were carried to Melbourne, where a fine monument marks his grave. This is almost all that remains of an expedition which started out with such fair prospects, but which came to grief at the foot of Mount Hopeless. End of section 22「Section 23 of From Pole to Pole by Sven Heden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 23. The North Polar Regions. Sir John Franklin and the Northwest Passage. We have now surveyed the Earth's mainland, islands, and seas. We have seen how man, by his endurance and thirst for knowledge, has penetrated everywhere how he has wandered over the hottest deserts and the coldest mountains. The nearer we come to our own times, the more eager have explorers become, and we no longer suffer blank patches to exist on our maps. The most obstinate resistance to the advance of man has been presented by the Poles and their surroundings, where the margin of the eternal ice seems to call out a peremptory, Thus far thou shalt come, but no farther but even the boundless ice-packs could not deter the bold and resolute seafarers. One vessel after another was lost, crew and all, but the icy sea was constantly plowed by fresh keels. The North Pole naturally exercised the greater attraction, for it lies nearer to Europe amidst the Arctic Ocean, which is enclosed between the coasts of Asia, Europe, and North America. In the forties of the last century, English and American explorers were occupied in searching for a northwest passage or a navigable channel for vessels making by the shortest route from North Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Let us look at the story of a famous expedition which set out to find this passage. Sir John Franklin was an officer in the Royal Navy. He had led expeditions by land and sea in both the northern and southern hemispheres, and in particular had mapped considerable areas of the north coast of America east of Bering Strait. Most of the coast of the mainland was thus known, and it remained only to find a channel between the large islands to the north of it. Such a passage must exist, but whether it was available for navigation was another question. A number of learned and experienced men decided to send out a large and well-furnished expedition for the purpose of effecting the Northwest Passage. The whole English people took up the scheme with enthusiasm. Hundreds of courageous men volunteered for the voyage, and Admiral Sir John Franklin was appointed leader of the expedition, from which neither he nor any of his subordinates was ever to return. The ships chosen were the Erebus and Terror, which, as we shall see later, had already made a voyage to the South Polar regions, and which were now refitted from keel to topmasts. Captain Crozier was the second in command and captain of the Terror, while Franklin hoisted his flag on the Erebus, where Captain James was under him. The members of the expedition were chosen with the greatest care, and when they were all mustered, the vessels had on board 23 officers and 111 men. Provisions were taken for three years, and the vessels were fitted with small auxiliary engines which had never before been tried in polar seas. The constituted authorities drew up a plan which Franklin was to follow, but he was left free to act as he thought proper when circumstances demanded alterations. 
The main thing was to sail north of America from the Atlantic side and come out into the Pacific Ocean through the Bering Strait. The Erebus and Terror left England on May 19, 1845. All officers and men were full of the most lively expectations of success and were resolved to do all in their power to achieve the object of the expedition. They passed the Orkney Islands, and on Midsummer Day saw the southern extremity of Greenland, Cape Farewell, disappear to windward. Next day they encountered the first ice, huge floating icebergs of wild, jagged form, or washed into rounded lumps by the actions of the waves, and ten days later the ships anchored near Disco Island on the west coast of Greenland. Here they met another vessel, which had come up north with an additional store of provisions and equipment. Its captain, the last man who spoke with Franklin and the members of the expedition, said that he had never seen a finer set of men so well prepared and so eager for their work. He thought that they could go anywhere. On July 26th, the Erebus and Terror were seen, for the last time, by an English whaler. After that day, the fate of the most unfortunate of all polar expeditions was involved in an obscurity much denser than that which surrounded Gordon and Khartoum after the telegraph line was cut. What is known only came to light many years later through relief expeditions that were sent out or was communicated by parties of wandering Eskimos. Meanwhile, the voyage was continued northwestward between two large islands into Lancaster Sound. Soon progress was delayed by masses of pack ice, and the engines were found to be so weak that they could be used only in smooth, open water. In another sound to the north, the water was open, and here the ships managed to sail 150 miles before the ice set fast again. Then they passed through another open sound back to the south. Early autumn had now come, and all the hills and mountains were covered with snow and fresh ice was forming in the sound. Here Franklin laid the Erebus and Terror up for the winter, having found fairly sheltered anchorage at a small island. What kind of life the men on board led during the long winter we do not know. We can only conjecture that the officers read and studied, and that the men were employed in throwing up banks of snow, reaching up above the bulwarks to keep in the warmth, that snow huts were built on the ice and on land for scientific observations, and that a hole was kept open day and night that water might always be procurable in case of fire when the pumps were frozen into pillars of ice. When the long night was over and February came with the faint illumination to the south, and when the sky grew brighter day by day till at last the expedition welcomed the return of the sun, probably men and officers made excursions to the neighboring islands to hunt. Their hopes revived with the increasing light. Only 260 miles of unknown coast remained of the Northwest Passage, and they believed that the new year would see them return home. The sun remained longer and longer above the horizon, and at last the long polar day commenced. When the Erebus and Terror were released in late summer from their prison of ice, and the small island could be at last left, three sailors remained on the beach. Their gravestones, carved with a few simple words, were found five years later by a relief expedition, and they constitute the only proof that Franklin wintered at this particular spot. To the south lay an open channel, and this southern passage must in time bend to the west. Mile after mile the vessel sailed southwards, carefully avoiding the drifting ice. East and west were seen the coasts of islands, and in front, in the distance, could be described King William Land, a large island which is the nearest neighbor to the mainland. The Northwest Passage was nearly accomplished, for it was now only about 120 miles westward to coasts already known. How hopelessly long this distance seemed, however, when the vessels were caught in the grip of the ice only a day or two later. Firmer and firmer the ice froze and heaped itself up around the Erebus and Terror. The days became shorter, the second winter drew on with rapid strides, and preparations to meet it were made as in the preceding year. The vessels lay frozen in on the 70th parallel, or a little south of the northernmost promontory of Scandinavia. But here there was no gulf stream to keep the sea open with its warm water. Little did the officers and crew suspect that the waves would never again splash around the hulls of the Erebus and Terror. 
we can well believe that they were not so cheerful this winter as in the former. The vessels were badly placed in the ice, in an open roadstead without the shelter of the coast. They lay as in a vice, and the hulls creaked and groaned under constant pressure. Life on board such an imprisoned vessel must be full of unrest. The vessel seems to moan and complain and pray that it may escape to the waves again. The men must wonder how long it will hold out, and must always be prepared for a deafening crash when the planks will give way and the ship, crushed like a nutshell, will sink at once. But worst of all is the darkness when the sun sets for the last time. However, the winter passed at last and the sun came back. It grew gradually light in the passages below deck, and it was no longer necessary to light a candle to read by in the evening. Soon there was no night at all, but the sun shone the whole twenty-four hours, and all the brighter because the vessels were surrounded by nothing but ice and snow. Far to the south and east were seen the hills on King William Land. If only the ice would release its hold and begin to drift. But the pack ice still remained to the westward, and it was possible, of course, that the vessels had been damaged by the pressure. Two officers with six men undertook a journey to the south coast of King William Land, whence the mainland of North America could be descried in clear weather. At their turning point, they deposited in a cairn a narrative of the most important events that had happened on board up to that date. This small document was found many years later. The little party returned with good news and bright hopes, but found sorrow on the ships. Admiral Franklin lay on his deathbed. The suspense had lasted too long for him. He just heard that the Northwest Passage had been practically discovered and died a few days later in June 1847. This was fortunate for him. His life had been a career of manliness and courage, and he might well go to sleep with a smile of victory on his lips. But we can imagine the gloom cast upon the expedition by the death of its leader. It was now the season when the ice begins to move, and open water may be expected. No doubt they made excursions in all directions to find out where the surge of the salt sea was nearest. Perhaps they resorted to ice saws and powder to get out, but in vain, the ice held them fast. However, they were delighted to find that the whole pack was moving southwards. Could they reach the mainland in this way? A great American company, named after Hudson's Bay, had small trading posts far in the north. If they could only reach one of them, they would be saved. Autumn came on, and their hope of getting free was disappointed. To try and reach the mainland now, when winter was approaching, was not to be thought of, for in winter no game is to be found in these endless wastes, and a journey southward meant, therefore, death by starvation. In summer, on the other hand, there was a prospect of falling in with reindeer and musk oxen, those singular polar animals as much like sheep as oxen, which live on lichens and mosses and do not wander farther south than the 60th parallel. In the western half of North America, the southern limit of the musk ox coincides with the northern limit of trees. A herd of 20 or 30 musk oxen would have saved Franklin's distressed mariners. If they could only have found polar bears, or even better, seals or whales, with their thick layer of blubber beneath the hide, an arctic hares would not have been despised, if in sufficient numbers. But the season was too far advanced, and the wild animals had retreated before the cold and the abundant snow which covered their scanty food. No doubt the officers deliberated on the plan they should adopt. They had maps and books on board, and they knew fairly accurately how far they had to travel to the nearest trading posts of the Hudson's Bay Company. And on the way, they had every prospect of finding game and meeting Eskimos. It was decided to pass the third winter on board. The cold increased, day by day, and the length of the days became shorter. The sun still rose, described a flat arch to the south, and sank after an hour and a half. Soon the days lasted only half an hour, until one day they had only a glimpse of the sun's upper curve and glittering for a moment like a flashing ruby above the horizon. Next day there was twilight at noon, but at any rate there was a reflection of the sunset red. During the following weeks, the gloominess became more and more intense. At noon, however, there was still a perceptible light, and the blood-red streak appeared to the south 
throwing a dull purple tinge over the ice pack. Then this dim illumination faded away also, and the polar night, which at this latitude lasts sixty days, and at the North Pole itself six months, was come, and the stars sparkled like torches on the bluish-black background, even when the bell struck midday in the officer's mess. Those who for the first time winter in high northern latitudes find a wonderful charm even in the polar night. They are astonished at the deep silence in the cold darkness, at the rushing, moaning howl of the snowstorms, and even at the overwhelming solitude and the total absence of life. Nothing, however, excites their astonishment and admiration so much as the northern lights. We know that the magnetic and electric forces of the earth, time after time, envelop practically the whole globe in a mantle of light, but this mysterious phenomenon is still unexplained. Usually, the aurora is inconstant. It flashes out suddenly, quivers for a moment in the sky, and then grows pale and vanishes. Most lasting are the bow-shaped northern lights, which sometimes stretch their milk-white arches high above the horizon. It may be that only one half of the arch is visible, rising like a pillar of light over the field of vision. Another time, the aurora takes the form of flames and rays, red below and green above, and darting rapidly over the sky. Farther north, the light is more yellowish. If groups of rays seem to converge to the same point, they are described as an auroral crown. Beautiful colors change quickly in these bundles of rays, but exceedingly seldom is the light as strong as that of the full moon. The light is grandest when it seems to fall like unrolled curtains vertically down, and is in undulating motion as though it fluttered in the wind. To the sailors in the ice-bound ships, however, the northern lights had lost their fascination. Enfeebled and depressed, disgusted with bad provisions, worn out with three years' hardships, they lay on their berths, listening to the ticking of their watches. The only break in their monotonous existence was when a death occurred. The carpenter had plenty of work, and Captain Crozier knew the funeral service by heart. Nine officers and eleven of the crew died during the last two winters, and certainly a far greater number in the third. This we know from a small slip of paper, well sealed up and deposited in a cairn on the coast, which was found eleven years afterwards. At length the months of darkness again came to an end. The red streak appeared once more in the south, and it gradually grew lighter. Twilight followed in the footsteps of darkness, and at last the first sun's rays glistened above the horizon. Then the men awakened once more to new hope. Brahmins on the banks of the Ganges never welcomed the rising sun with more delight. With increasing daylight came greater opportunity and disposition to work. Several sledges were made ready, heavy and clumsy, but strong. Three whale boats, which for three years had hung fast frozen to the davits, were loosened and hauled on to the ice. The best of the provisions still remaining in the storeroom were taken out, and great piles of things were raised round the boats. When everything to be taken was down on the ice, the stores, tents, instruments, guns, ammunition, and all the other articles were packed on the sledges. The three whale boats were bound with ropes, each on a separate sledge, and a sledge with a comfortable bed was assigned to the invalids. During all this work, the days had grown longer, and at last the men could no longer control their eagerness to set out. This early start sealed their fate for neither game nor Eskimos come up so far north till the summer is well advanced, and even with the sledges fully laden, their provisions would only last forty days. On April 22, 1848, the signal for departure was given, and the heavy sledges creaked slowly and in jerks over the uneven snow-covered ice. Axes, picks, and spades were constantly in use to break to pieces the sharp ridges and blocks in the way. The distance to King William Land was only 15 miles, yet it took them three days to get there. The masts and hulls of the Erebus and Terror grew smaller all too slowly, but they vanished at last. Captain Crozier perceived that it was impossible to proceed in this manner, so all baggage was looked through again and every unnecessary article was discarded. At this place, one of the relief expeditions found quantities of things, uniform decorations, brass buttons, 
metal articles, etc., which no doubt had been thought suitable for barter with Eskimos and Indians. With lightened sledges, they marched on along the west coast. They had not traveled far when John Irving, the lieutenant on the terror, died. Dressed in his uniform, wrapped in sailcloth, and with a silk handkerchief round his head, he was interred between stones set on end and covered with a flat slab. On his head was laid a silver medal with an inscription on the obverse side, Second Prize in Mathematics at the Royal Naval College, awarded to John Irving, Midsummer, 1830. Owing to the medal, the deceased officer was identified long after, and so in time was laid to rest in his native town. Two bays on the west coast of King William Land have been named after the unfortunate ships. At the shore of the northern, Erebus Bay, the strength of the English seamen was so weakened that they had to abandon two of the boats, together with the sledges on which they had been drawn so far uselessly. At their arrival in Terror Bay, the bonds of comradeship were no longer strong enough to keep the party together, or it may be that they agreed to separate. They were now less than a hundred men. At any rate, they divided into two parties, probably of nearly equal strength. The one, which evidently consisted of the more feeble, turned back towards the ships, where at least they would obtain shelter against wind and weather, and where there were provisions left. The other continued along the south coast with a whale boat, and intended to cross to the mainland and try to reach the Great Fish River. No doubt, when they had been succored themselves, they meant to return to their distressed comrades. Terrible must have been the march of the returning party, and terrible also that of those who went on. Of the former, we know next to nothing. The latter marched and marched, dragging their heavy sledges after them till they died, one after another. There was no longer any thought of burying the dead. Everyone had to take care of himself. If a dying man lagged behind, the others could not stop on his account. Some died as they were walking. This was proved afterwards by the skeletons which were found lying on their faces. Not a trace of game was found in May and June on the island, and they dragged their heavy ammunition boxes and guns to no purpose, not firing a shot. Now the small remnant waited only for open water to cross the sound to the mainland. At the beginning of June, the ice broke up, and it may be taken for granted that at this time the survivors actually crossed, for the boat was afterwards found in a bay called Starvation Cove. If only the boat had been found there, it might have been drifted over by the wind and waves, but skeletons and articles both in and outside the boat were found, showing that it was manned when it passed over the sound and when it landed. Many circumstances connected with this sad journey are mysterious. Why did the men drag the heavy whaleboat with them for two months when they must have seen the mainland to the south the year before on the excursion which they undertook when the admiral was lying on his deathbed? Where the sound is narrowest, it is only three miles broad, and besides, they could have crossed anywhere on the ice. But as all died, and as not a line in the diary came to light, we know nothing about it. When no news was heard of Franklin after two years, the first relief expeditions were sent out. Time passed, and it became still more certain that he was in need of help. In the autumn of 1850, fifteen ships were on the outlook for him. The most courageous and energetic of all, who for years would not give up hope of seeing him again, was Franklin's wife. She spent all her means in relief work. In the course of six years, the English government dispersed 890,000 pounds in relief expeditions. Most of them were useless, for when they set out, the disaster had already taken place. One expedition which sailed in 1848 was caught in the ice and resorted to a singular means of sending information to the distressed men, wherever they might be. About a hundred foxes were caught and fitted with brass collars in which a short description of the position of the relief ship was engraved, and then the foxes were let loose again. In 1854, the names of Franklin, Crozier, and all the other men were removed from the muster rolls of the Royal Navy. A statue of Franklin was set up in his native town, and a memorial of marble was erected in Westminster Abbey with the words of Tennyson. Not here, 
the white north has thy bones and thou heroic sailor soul art passing on thine happier voyage now toward no earthly pole the voyage of the vega a brilliant remembrance of the arctic ocean is the pride of the swedes the northwest passage had been discovered by englishmen but the northeast passage which for three hundred fifty years had been attempted by all seafaring nations was not yet achieved by a series of voyages to spitzbergen greenland and Yenisi, adolf nordenskiold had made himself an experienced polar voyager he perfected a scheme to sail along the north coasts of europe and asia and through the bering strait out into the pacific ocean his plan then was nothing less than to circumnavigate asia and europe an exploit which had never been performed and which the learned declared to be impossible it was thought that the pack ice always lay pressed up against the siberian coast rendering it impossible to get past parts had been already sailed along and stretches of coasts were known but the voyage all the way to the bering strait was out of the question now nordenskiold reasoned that the ice must begin to drift in summer and leave an open channel close to the land the great siberian rivers the obi the yenisi and the lena bring down volumes of warm water from southern regions into the arctic ocean as this water is fresh it must spread itself over the heavier sea water and must form a surface current which keeps the ice at a distance and the passage open along the ice-free coast a vessel could sail anywhere and pass out into the pacific ocean before the end of summer accordingly he made ready for a voyage in which the vega was to sail around asia and europe and carry his name to the ends of the earth the vega was a whaler built to encounter drift ice in the northern seas a staff of scientific observers was appointed and a crew of seventeen swedish men-o-war's men were selected the vega was to be the home of thirty men and provisions were taken for two years smaller vessels were to accompany her for part of the voyage laden with coal the vega left karlskrona in june eighteen seventy eight and steamed along the coast of norway past the north cape towards the east the islands of Novaya zemla were left behind the waters of the obi and yenisi splashed against the hull no drift ice opposed the passage of the swedish vessel and on august nineteenth cape cheliuskin the most northern point of the old world was reached farther east the coast was followed to nordenski old sea great caution was necessary for the fairway was shallow and the vega often steamed across bays which were represented as land on maps the delta of the lena was left behind and to the east of this only small rivers entered the sea nordenskiel therefore feared that the last bit of the voyage would be the hardest for open water along the coast could not be depended upon at the end of august the most westerly of the group called the new siberia islands was sighted the vega could not go at full speed for the sea was shallow and floating fragments of ice were in the way the prospects became brighter again however open water stretching for a long distance eastward on september sixth two large skin boats appeared full of fur-clad natives who had rowed out from land all of the men on the vega except the cook hastened on deck to look at these unexpected visitors of the chukchi race they rushed up the companion ladder talking and laughing and were well received being given tobacco dutch clay pipes old clothes and other presents none of the vega men understood a word they said but the chukchis chattered gaily all the same and with their hands full of presents tumbled down to their boats again and rowed home two days later the vega was in the midst of ice and fog and had to be moored to a flow near land then came more chukchis who pulled the swedes by the collar and pointed to the skin tents on land the invitation was accepted with pleasure by several of the vega men who rowed to land and went from tent to tent in one of them reindeer meat was boiling in a cast iron pot over the fire outside another two reindeer were being cut up each tent contained an inner sleeping room of deerskin which was lighted and warmed by lamps of train oil there played small stark naked children plump and chubby as little pigs and sometimes they ran in the same light attire out over the rhyme between the tents 
the tiniest were carried well wrapped up in furs on the backs of their fathers and mothers and whatever pranks they played these small wildcats never heard a harsh word from their elders the next day the vega tried to continue her voyage but the fog was too dense and the shelter of a mass of ground ice had again to be sought nordenskiold was however sure of gaining the pacific ocean in a short time and when fresh visitors came on board he distributed tobacco and other presents among them with a lavish hand he also distributed a number of krona pieces and fifty earrings which if any misfortune happened to the vega would serve to show her course during the following days the ice closed up and fog lay dense over the sea only now and then could the vessel sail a short distance and then was stopped and had to moor again on september eighteenth the vessel glided gently and cautiously between huge blocks of grounded ice like castle walls and towers of glass here patience and great care were necessary for the coast was unknown and there was frequently barely a span of water beneath the keel the captain stood on the bridge and whenever there was a gap between the ice blocks he made for it it was only possible to sail in the daytime and at night the vega lay fastened by her ice anchors one calm and fine evening some of our seafarers went ashore and lighted an enormous bonfire of driftwood here they sat talking of the warm countries they would sail past in two months they were only a few miles from the easternmost extremity of asia at bering strait the vega had anchored on the eastern side of koliuchin bay it was september twenty eighth newly formed ice had stretched a tough sheet between the scattered blocks of ground ice and to the east lay an ice belt barely six miles broad if only a south wind would spring up the pack would drift northwards and the last short bit of the northeast passage would be traversed but the fates decreed otherwise no wind appeared the temperature fell and the ice increased in thickness if the vega had come a few hours sooner she would not have been stopped on the very threshold of the pacific ocean and how easily might these few hours have been saved during the voyage the vega was entrapped so unexpectedly in the ice that there was not even time to look for safe and sheltered winter quarters she lay about a mile from the coast exposed to the northern storms under strong ice pressure she might easily drift southwards run aground capsized or be crushed the ice pack became heavier in all directions and by October 10th, the Chukchis were able to come out on foot to the vessel. Preparations were made for the winter. High banks of snow were thrown up around, and on the deck a thick layer of snow was left to keep the heat in. From the bridge to the bow was stretched a large awning, under which the Chukchis were received daily. It was like a marketplace, and here barter trade was carried on. A collection of household utensils, implements of the chase, clothes, and indeed everything which the northern people made with their own hands, was acquired during the winter. The Vega soon became quite a rendezvous for the three hundred Chukchis living in the neighborhood, and one team of dogs after another came daily rushing through the snow. They had small light sledges drawn by six to ten dogs, shaggy and strong, but thin and hungry. The dogs had to lie waiting in the snow on the ice while their master sat bargaining under the large awning. At every baking on board, special loaves were made for the native visitors, who would sit by the hour watching the smith shaping the white hot iron on his anvil. Women and children were regaled with sugar and cakes, and all the visitors went round and looked about just as they liked on the deck, where a quantity of articles, weapons, and utensils lay about. Not the smallest trifle disappeared. The Chukchis were honest and decent people, and the only roguery they permitted themselves was to try and persuade the men of the Vega that a skinned and decapitated fox was a hare. When it grew dusk, the fur-clad polar savages went down the staircase of ice from the deck, put their teams in order, took their seats in the sledges, and set off again over the ice to their tents of reindeer skins. The winter was stormy and severe. Clouds of snow swept over the ice, fine and dry as flour. Again and again the cold scene was lighted up by the arcs of the aurora. In the middle of December, the planks in the sides of the vega cracked as the ice pressed in against her. If the pressure had been bad, the vessel might have broken to pieces and have sunk in a few minutes. 
it would not have been so serious for the crews as in the case of the Erebus and Terror, for here there were people far and near. But to ensure a safe retreat, the men of the Vega carried to the nearest shore provisions, guns, and ammunition to last a hundred men for thirty days. These things were all stacked up in a heap covered with sails and oars. No watch was kept at the depot, and though the Chukchis knew that valuable goods lay under the sails, they never touched a thing. Near the Vega, two holes were always kept open. In one, the captain observed the rise and fall of the tide. The other was for water in case of fire. A small seal splashed for a long time in one of the holes and came up on the ice after fishing below. One day his retreat was cut off, and he was caught and brought up on deck. When fish bought from the Chukchis had been offered to him in vain, he was let loose in the hole again, and he never came back. A house of ice was erected for the purpose of observing the wind and weather, and a thermometer cage was set up on the coast. Men took turns to go out, and each observer remained six hours at the ice house and the cage to read off the various instruments. It was bitterly cold going out when the temperature fell to minus 51 degrees, but the compulsory walk was beneficial. One danger was that a man might lose his way when the snowstorms raged in the dark winter nights, so a line was stretched the whole way, supported on posts of ice, and with this guide it was impossible to go astray. Then came Christmas, when they slaughtered two fat pigs which had been brought on purpose. The middle deck was swept out, all the litter was cleared away, and the flags were hung around the walls and ceiling. The Chukchis brought willow bushes from the valleys beyond the mountains to the south, and branches were fashioned around a trunk of driftwood. This was the Vega's Christmas tree, and it was decked with strips of colored paper and small wax candles. Officers and men swung round in merry dance beneath a flaming lantern suspended from the roof. Two hundred Christmas boxes were found packed on board, parting gifts of friends and acquaintances. For these, lots were drawn, and many amusing surprises excited general hilarity. So the polka was danced on the deck while cold rained outside and snow whizzed through the frozen rigging. For supper there was ham and Christmas ale, just as at home in Sweden. Old, well-known songs echoed through the saloon, and toasts were given of king and country, officers and men, and the fine little vessel which had carried our Vikings from their home in the west to their captivity in the shore ice of Siberia. The winter ran its course, and the days lengthened in the spring. Cold and continual storms were persistent. Even a Chukchi dog can have too much of them. One day at the end of February, a Chukchi who had lost his way came on board, carrying a dog by the hind legs. The man had lost his way on the ice and had slept out in the cold with his dog. A capital dinner was served for him on the middle deck, and the dog was rolled about and pummeled till he came to life again. During the spring, the Vega explorers made several longer or shorter excursions with dog sledges and visited all the villages in the country. Of course, they became the best of friends with the Chukchis. The language was the difficulty at first, but somehow or other they learned enough of it to make themselves understood. Even the sailors struggled with the Chukchi vocabulary and tried to teach their savage friends Swedish. One of the officers learned to speak Chukchi fluently and compiled a dictionary of this peculiar language. Summer came on, but the ground was not free from ice until July. The Vega still lay fast, as in a vice. On July 18th, Nordenskiold made ready for another excursion on land. The captain had long had the engines ready and the boilers cleaned. Just as they were sitting at dinner in the wardroom, they felt the Vega roll a little. The captain rushed up on deck. The pack had broken up and left a free passage open. Fire under the boilers, was the order, and two hours later, at half past three o'clock, the Vega glided under steam and sail and a festoon of flags away from the home of the Chukchis. Farther east, the sea was like a mirror and free of ice beneath the fog. Walruses raised their shiny wet heads above the water in which numerous seals disported themselves. With the wildest delight, the Vega expedition sailed southwards through Bering Strait. 
In the year 1553, a daring Englishman had commenced the quest of the Northeast Passage and had perished with all his men, and during the following centuries, numberless other expeditions had tried to solve the problem, but always in vain. Now it was solved by Swedes. The vessel glided out into the Pacific Ocean without a leak. Not a man had been lost, and not one had been seriously ill. It was one of the most fortunate and most brilliant polar voyages that had ever been achieved. Yokohama was the first port, where the Vega was welcomed with immense jubilation, and then the homeward journey via the Suez Canal and Gibraltar became a continuous triumphal procession. Nansen From many signs around the northern cap of the world, a young Norwegian, Fritjof Nansen, came to the conclusion that a constant current must flow from the neighborhood of Bering Strait to the east coast of Greenland. Nansen resolved to make use of this current. Others had gone up from the Atlantic side and been driven back by the current. He would start from the opposite side and get the help of the current. Others had feared and avoided the pack ice. He would make for it and allow himself to be caught in it. Others had sailed in unsuitable vessels which had been crushed like nutshells among the floes. He would build a vessel with sides sloping inwards which would afford no hold to the ice. The more the ice pressed, the more surely would his ship be lifted up out of the water and be borne safely on the ice with the current. The progress would be slow, no doubt, but the expedition would see regions of the world never before visited and would have opportunities of investigating the depth of the sea, the weather, and winds. To reach the small point called the North Pole was, in Nansen's opinion, of minor importance. Among the many who wished to go with him, he chose the best twelve. The vessel was christened the Fram, and the captain was named Sverdrup. He had been with Nansen before, on an expedition when they crossed the inland ice of Greenland from coast to coast. They took provisions for five years and were excellently equipped. The first thing was to reach the new Siberia islands. To those, the Vega had shown the way, and the Fram had only to follow in her track. Just to the west of them, a course was steered northwards, and soon the vessel was set fast in the ice and was lifted satisfactorily onto its surface without the smallest leak. So far, everything had gone as Nansen anticipated, and the experienced polar voyagers who had declared that the whole scheme was madness had to acknowledge that they were not so clever as they thought. We have, unfortunately, no time to accompany the voyagers on their slow journey. They got on well and were comfortable on board. The ice groaned and cracked as usual, but within the heavy timbers of the Fram there was peace. The night came, long, dark, and silent, Polar bears stalked outside and were often shot. Before it became quite dark, Nansen tried the dogs at drawing sledges. They were harnessed, but when he took a seat, off they went in the wildest career. They romped over blocks and holes, and Nansen was thrown backwards, but sat fast in the sledge and could not be thrown out. In time, the driving went better, and the poor faithful animals had always to go on sledge excursions. Two were seized by polar bears, and two were bitten to death by their comrades. One fine day, however, puppies came into the world in the midst of the deepest darkness. When they first saw the sun, they barked furiously. The Fram drifted northwest, just as Nansen had foreseen, passing over great depths where two thousand fathom line did not reach the bottom. Christmas was kept with a Norwegian festival, and when the 80th parallel was crossed, a tremendous feast was held, but the return of the sun on February 20 excited the greatest delight. The spring and summer passed without any remarkable events. Kennels were erected on the ice out of boxes, and more puppies came into the world. Possibly these were as much astonished at the winter darkness as their cousins had been at seeing the sun. Nansen had long been pondering on a bold scheme, namely to advance with dog sledges as far as possible to the north, and then turn southwards to Franz Josef Land. The ship was, meanwhile, to go on with the drift and the usual observations were to be taken on board. Only one man was to go with him, and he chose Lieutenant Johansen. He first spoke to him about the scheme in November 1894, 
It was, of course, a matter of life or death, so he told Johansson to take a day or two to think it over before he gave his answer. But the latter said, yes, at once, without a moment's hesitation. Then we will begin our preparations tomorrow, said Nansen. All the winter was spent in them. They made two kayaks, each to hold a single man, somewhat larger and stronger than those the Eskimos use when they go fishing or seal hunting. With a frame of ribs covered with sailcloth, these canoes weighed only 30 pounds. They were covered in all over, and when the boatman had taken his seat in the middle and made all tight around him, seas might sweep right over him and the kayak without doing any harm. A dog sledge, harness, a sleeping bag for two, skis, staffs, provisions, oil cooking stove, all was made ready. The start took place at the turn of the year, when the most terrible ice pressure broke loose on all sides, threatening the Fram. Mountains of ice blocks and snow were thrust against the vessel, which was in danger of being buried under them. The seawater was forced up over the ice, and the dogs were nearly drowned in their kennels, and had to be rescued quickly. Banks of ice were pushed against the vessel, rolled over bulwarks, and weighed down the awning on the deck, and it was pitch dark so that they could not find out where the danger threatened. They had, however, stored provisions for 200 days in a safe place. By degrees, the ice came to rest again, and the great rampart was digged away. Twice did Nansen and Johansen set out northwards, only to come back again. Once a sledge broke, and on that other occasion the load was too heavy. On March 14th they left the Fram for the last time and directed their steps northward. They had three sledges and 28 dogs, but they themselves walked on skis and looked after their teams. At first the ice was level and the pace was rapid, but afterwards it became lumpy and uneven and traveling was slow as first one sledge and then another stuck fast. After two marches, the temperature fell to minus 45 degrees, and it was very cold in the small silk tent. They were able to march for nine hours, and when the ice was level, it seemed as if the endless white plains might extend up to the pole. So long as they were traveling, they did not feel the cold, but the perspiration from their bodies froze in their clothes, so that they were encased in a hauberk of ice which cracked at every step. Nansen's wrists were made sore by rubbing against his hard sleeves and did not heal till far on in the summer. They always looked out for some sheltered crevice in the ice to camp in. Johansen looked after the dogs and fed them while Nansen set up the tent and filled the pot with ice. The evening meal was the pleasantest in the day, for then, at any rate, they were warmed inside. After it, they packed themselves in their sleeping bag when the ice on their clothes melted and they lay all night long as in a cold compress. They dreamed of sledges and dog teams, and Johansen would call out to the dogs in his sleep, urging them on. Then they would wake up again in the bitter morning, rouse up the dogs lying huddled up together and growling at the cold, disentangle the trace lines, load the sledges, and off they would go through the great solitude. Only too frequently the ice was unfavorable. The sledges stuck fast, and had to be pushed over ridges and fissures. They struggle on northwards, however, and have traveled a degree of latitude. It is tiring work to march and crawl in this way, and sometimes they are so worn out that they almost go to sleep on their skis while the dogs gently trot beside them. The dogs, too, are tired of this toil, and two of them have to be killed. They are cut up and distributed among their comrades, some of whom refuse to turn cannibals. When the ice became still worse and the cold white desert looked like a heap of stones as far northward as the eye could see, Nansen decided to turn back. It was impossible to find their way back to the Fram, for several snowstorms had swept over the ice, obliterating their tracks. The only thing to do was to steer a course for the group of islands called Franz Joseph Land. It was 430 miles off, and the provisions were coming to an end, but when the spring really set in, they would surely find game, and they had for their two guns a hundred and eighty cartridges with ball and a hundred and fifty with shot. The dogs had the worst of it. For them it was a real dog's life up there. The stronger were gradually to eat up the weaker. So they turned back and made long marches over easy ice. 
One day they saw a complete tree trunk sticking up out of the ice. What singular fortunes it must have experienced since it parted from its root. At the end of April, the spore of two foxes was seen in the snow. Was land near, or what were these fellows doing out here on the ice-covered sea? Two days later, a dog named Julin was sacrificed. He was born on the Fram, and during his short life had never seen anything but snow and ice. Now he was worn out and exhausted, and the travelers were sorry to part from the faithful soul. Open water, sunlit billows, how delightful to hear them splash against the edge of the ice. The sound seemed to speak of spring and summer, and to give them a greeting from the great ocean and the way back home. More tracks as a fox as indicated land, and they looked out for it daily. They did not suspect that they had to travel for three months to the nearest island. At the beginning of May, only 16 dogs were left. Now the long summer day commenced in the Arctic Ocean, and when the temperature was only 20 degrees below the freezing point, they suffered from heat. But the ice was bad, and they had to force the sledges over deep channels and high hummocks thrust up by pressure. After great difficulties, they staggered along on skis. The work became heavier for the dogs, as fewer were left, but the provisions also diminished. A furious snowstorm compelled them to remain in a camp. There they left one of the sledges, and some broken skis were offered to the flames and made a grand fire. Six dogs could still be harnessed to each of the two remaining sledges. At the end of May, they came to an expanse of ice intersected by a network of channels with open water which blocked the way. Now animal life began to appear with the coming of summer. In the large opening were seen the gray backs of narwhals rolling over in the dark blue water. A seal or two were seeking fish, and tracks of polar bears made them long for fresh meat. Nansen often made long excursions in front to see where the ice was best. Then Johansen remained waiting by the sledges, and if the bold ski runner were long away, he began to fear that an accident had happened. He dared not pursue his thoughts to an end. He would then be quite alone. June comes. The scream of ivory gulls pierces the air. The two men remain a week in camp to make their kayak seaworthy. They have still bread for quite a month. Only six dogs are left, and when only three remain, they will have to harness themselves to the sledges. In a large strip of open water, they shoved out the kayaks, fastened them together with skis, and paddled them along the margin of the ice. On the other side, they shot two seals and three polar bears, and therefore had meat for a long time. The last two dogs, too, could eat their fill. At last, the land they longed for appeared to the south, and they hastened thither, a man and a dog to each sledge. Once, they had again to cross a strip of open water in kayaks. Nansen was at the edge of the ice when he heard Johansen call out, Get your gun! Nansen turned and saw that a large bear had knocked Johansen down and was sniffing at him. Nansen was about to take up his gun, when the kayak slipped out into the water, and while he was hauling and pulling at it, he heard Johnson say quite quietly, You must look sharp if you want to be in time. So at last he got hold of his gun, and the bear received his death wound. For five months they had struggled over the ice, when at the beginning of August they stood at the margin of the ice and had open water before them off the land. Now the sea voyage was to begin, and they had to part with their last two dogs. It was a bitter moment. Nansen took Johansen's dog and Johansen Nansen's, and a couple of bullets were the reward of their faithfulness. Now they traveled more easily and quickly. The kayaks were fastened together, and with masts and sails they skimmed past unknown islands. Heavy seas forced them to land on one of them. Just as they drew up their kayaks, a white bear came waddling along, got scent of them, and began to sniff along their track. To our travelers, his visit meant provisions for a long time. Nansen and his traveling companion took possession of their new territory, wandered over the island, and returned to their dinner of bear, which did them good. Next day, they looked for a suitable dwelling place. As they could not find a cave, they built a small stone cabin, which they roofed with skis and the silk tent. Light and wind came in on all sides, but it was comfortable enough, and the meat pot bubbled over a fire of fat. Nansen decided to remain on this island for the winter. 
The islands they had hitherto seen were unlike any of the known parts of Franz Joseph land, and Nansen did not know exactly where he was. It was impossible to venture out onto the open sea in the kayaks. It was better to lay in a supply of food for the winter, for when the darkness came, all the game would disappear. First of all, they must build a comfortable hut. There was plenty of stone and moss. A trunk of driftwood found on the beach would form a roof ridge, and if they could only get hold of a couple of walruses, their roofing would be provided. A large male walrus was lying puffing out in the water. The kayaks were shoved out and lashed together, and from them the colossus was bombarded. He died but came up under the boats, and the whole contrivance was nearly capsized. At last he received his death wound, but just as Nansen was about to strike his harpoon into him, he sank. They had better luck, however, with two others, which lay bellowing on the ice and gradually went to sleep, unconscious that their minutes were numbered. Nansen says that it seemed like murder to shoot them, and that he never forgot their brown, imploring, melancholy eyes as they lay supporting their heads on their tusks and coughing up blood. Then the great brutes were flayed, and their flesh, blubber, and hides carried into the hut. When they brought out the sledges and knives, Nansen thought it might be well to take the kayaks with them also. And that was fortunate, for while they stood cutting up as in a slaughterhouse, a strong, biting land wind sprang up. Their ice flow parted from the land ice and drifted away from the island. Dark green water and white foaming surge yawned behind them. There was no time to think. They were drifting out to sea as fast as they could, but to go back empty-handed would have been too vexatious. So they cut off a quarter of a hide and dragged it with some lumps of blubber to the kayaks. They reached the land in safety, dead tired after an adventurous row, and sought the shelter of the hut. In the night came a bear mama with two large cubs and made a thorough inspection of the outside of the hut. The mother was shot, and the cubs made off to the shore, plunged in, and swam out to a slab of ice which would just bear them, and scrambled up. There they stood moaning and whining, and wondering why their mother stayed so long on shore. One tumbled over the edge, but climbed up again onto the slippery flow, and the clean salt water ran off his fur. They drifted away with the wind, and soon looked like two white spots on the almost black water. Nansen and Johansen wanted their meat, the more because the bears had torn and mangled all the walrus meat lying outside the hut. The kayaks were pushed out and were soon on the farther side of the floe with the bear cubs. They were chased into the water and followed all the way to the beach, where they were shot. Things now began to look better. Three bears all at once. Then the first walrus came to the surface again, and while he was being skinned, another came to look on and had to join him. It was disgusting work to flay the huge brutes. Both the men had their worn clothes smeared with train oil and blood so that they were soaked right through. Ivory and glaucous gulls, noisy and greedy, collected from far and near and picked up all the offal. They would soon fly south, the sea would be covered with ice, and the polar night would be so dismal and silent. It took a week to get the new hut ready. The shoulder blade of a walrus fastened to a ski served as a spade. A walrus tusk tied to a broken ski staff made an excellent hoe. Then they raised the walls of the hut, and inside they dug into the ground and made a sort of couch for both of them, which they covered with bearskin. After two more walruses had been shot, they had plenty of roofing material, which they laid down over the trunk of driftwood. A bear came, indeed, and pulled down everything, but it cost him dear, and afterwards the roof was strengthened with a weight of stones. To make a draft through the open fireplace, they set up on the roof a chimney of ice. Then they moved into the new hut, which was to be their abode through the long winter. On October 15th, they saw the sun for the last time. The bears vanished and did not return till the next spring. But the foxes were left, and they were extremely inquisitive and thievish. They stole their sail thread and steel wire, their harpoon and line, and it was quite impossible to find the stolen goods again. What they wanted with a thermometer which lay outside, it is hard to conceive, for it must have been all the same to the foxes how many degrees of temperature there were in their earths. All winter they were up on the roof, 
pattering, growling, howling, and quarreling. There was a pleasant rattling up above, and the two men really would not have been without their fox company. One can hardly say that the days passed slowly, for the whole winter was, of course, one long night. It was so silent and empty, and an oppressive, solemn stillness reigned during the calm night. Sometimes the aurora blazed in a mysterious crown in the sky, at other times so dark and the stars glittered with inconceivable brilliance. The weather, however, was seldom calm. Usually the wind howled round the bare rocks, lashed by millions of storms since the earliest times, and snow swished outside and built up walls close around the hut. The endlessly long night passed slowly on. The men ate and slept and walked up and down in the darkness to stretch their limbs. Then came Christmas with its old memories. They cleaned up, sweep and brush, and take up a foot's depth of frozen refuse from the floor of the hut. They rummage for some of the last good things from the fram. And then Nansen lies listening and fancies he hears the church bells at home. In the midst of the winter night comes New Year's Day, when it is so cold that they can only lie down and sleep, and look out of their sleeping bag only to eat. Sometimes they do not put out their noses for twenty hours on end, but lie dozing, just like the bears in their lairs. On the last day of February, the sun at last appears again. He is heartily welcome and he is accompanied by some morning birds, little ox. The two men are frightened of each other when daylight shines on them, as their hair and beards have grown so long. They have not washed for a year or more, and are as black in the face as Negroes. Nansen, who is usually extremely fair, now has jet black hair. They may be excused for not bathing at a temperature of minus 40 degrees. The first bear has come. Here he is, scratching at the hut and wanting to get in. There is such a good smell from inside. A bullet meets him on the way, and as he runs off up a steep slope, he gets another and comes rolling down in wild bounces like a football. They lived on him for six weeks. While the days grew lighter, they worked on a new outfit. They made trousers out of their blankets. Shoes were patched. Rope was cut out of walrus hide. New runners were put on the sledges. The provisions were packed, and on May 19th they left their cabin and marched farther southwest. Time after time they had to rest on account of snowstorms. They had thrown away the tent, and instead they crept in between the sledges covered with their sail. Once Nansen came down when on skis, and would have been drowned if Johansen had not helped him up in time. The snow lying on this ice was soaked with water. They had always to keep their eyes open and look for firm ice. The provisions came to an end, but the sea swarmed with walruses. Sometimes the animals were so bold that Nansen would go up to them and take photographs. When a fine brute had been shot, the others still lay quiet, and only by hitting them with their alpenstocks could the travelers get rid of them. Then the animals would waddle off in single file and plunge head first into the water, which seemed to boil up around them. Once they had such level ice and a good wind behind them that they hoisted sail on the sledges, stood on skis in front of them to steer, and flew along so that the snow was thrown up around them. Another time they sailed with the kayaks lashed together and went ashore on an island to get a better view. The kayak raft was moored with a walrus rope. As they were strolling around, Johansen called out, Hello, the kayaks are adrift. They ran down. The wind was blowing off the land. Out on the fjord, all they possessed in the world was being mercilessly carried away. Take my watch, cried Nansen, and throwing off a few clothes, he jumped into the ice-cold water and swam after the kayaks. But they drifted more rapidly than Nansen swam, and the case seemed hopeless. He felt his limbs growing numb, but he thought he might as well drown as swim back without the boats. He struck out for his life, became tired, lay on his back, went on again, saw that the distance was lessening, and put out all his strength for a last spurt. He was quite spent and on the point of sinking when he caught hold of one of the canoes and could hang on and get his breath. Then he heaved himself up into the kayak and rowed back shivering with chattering teeth, benumbed and frozen blue. 
When he reached the land, Johansen put him in the sleeping bag and laid over him everything he could find. And when he had slept a few hours, he was as lively as a cricket and did justice to the supper. Farther and farther south, they continued their daring journey over ice and waves. A walrus came up beside Nansen's canoe and tried its solidity with his tusks, nearly taking the kayak and oarsman down with him to the salt depths. When the animal went off, Nansen felt uncomfortably cold and wet about the legs. He rode to the nearest ice, where the kayak sank in shallow water, and all he possessed was wet and spoiled. Then they had to give themselves a good rest and repair all damages, while walruses grunted and snorted close beside them. This journey of Nansen's is a unique feat in the history of polar travels. Of the crews of the Erebus and Terror, a hundred and thirty-four men, not one had escaped, though they had not lost their vessels, and though they lay quite close to a coast where there were human beings and game. But these two Norwegians had now held out in the polar sea for fifteen months, and had preserved their lives and limbs, and were in excellent condition. Their hour of delivery was at hand. On June 17th, Nansen ascended an ice hummock and listened to the commotion made by a whole multitude of birds. What now? He listens, holding his breath. No, it is impossible. Yes, indeed, that is a dog's bark. It must surely be a bird with a peculiar cry. No, it is a dog barking. He hurried back to camp. Johansen thought it was a mistake. They bolted their breakfast. Then Nansen fastened skis on his feet, took his gun, field glass, and alpenstock, and flew swiftly as the wind over the white snow. See, there are the footprints of a dog. Perhaps a fox? No, they would be much smaller. He flies over the ice toward the lands. Now he hears a man's voice. He yells with all the power of his lungs and takes no heed of holes and lumps as he speeds along toward life, safety, and home. Then a dog runs up barking. Behind him comes a man. Nansen hurries to meet him and both wave their caps. Whoever this traveler with a dog may be, he has a good reason for astonishment at seeing a jet-black giant come jolting on skis straight from the North Pole. They meet. They put out their hands. How do you do? asks the Englishman. Very well, thank you, says Nansen. I am very glad to see you here. So am I, cries Nansen. The Englishman with the dog is named Jackson, and has been for two years in France Joseph Land making sledge journeys and explorations. He concludes that the black man on skis is someone from the Fram, but when he hears that it is Nansen himself, he is still more astonished and agreeably surprised. They went to Jackson's house, whither Johansen also was fetched. Both our explorers washed with soap and brush several times to get off the worst of the dirt, all that was not firmly set and embedded in their skins. They scrubbed and scraped and changed their clothes from top to toe, and at last looked like human beings. Later in the summer, a vessel came with supplies for Jackson. With this vessel, Nansen and Johansen sailed home. At Vardo, they received telegrams from their families, and their delight was unbounded. Only one thing troubled them. Where was the Fram? Some little time later, Nansen was awakened at Hammerfest one morning by a telegraph messenger. The telegram he brought read, Fram arrived in good condition, all well on board, shall start at once for Tromso, welcome home. The sender of the telegram was the captain of the Fram, the brave and faithful Sverdrup. End of section 23。section 24 of From Pole to Pole by Sven Heden this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 24. The South Polar Regions It is barely a hundred years since European mariners began to approach the coasts of the mysterious mainland which extends around the southern pole of the earth. Ross, who in 1831 discovered the North Magnetic Pole, sailed ten years later in two ships, the Erebus and the Terror, afterwards to become so famous with Franklin, along the coast of the most southern of all seas, a sea which still bears his name. He discovered an active volcano not much less than 13,000 feet high and named it Erebus, 
while to another extinct volcano he gave the name of terror and he saw the lofty ice barrier which in some places is as much as three hundred feet high at a much later time there was great rivalry among european nations to contribute to the knowledge of the world's sixth continent in the year nineteen o one an english expedition under captain scott was despatched to the sea and coasts first visited by ross captain scott made great and important discoveries on the coast of the sixth continent and advanced nearer to the South Pole than any of his predecessors. One of the members of the expedition followed his example some years later. His name is Shackleton, and his journey is famous far and wide. Shackleton resolved to advance from his winter quarters as far as possible towards the South Pole, and with only three other men he set out at the end of October 1908. His sledges were drawn by strong, plump ponies obtained from Manchuria. They were fed with maize, compressed fodder, and concentrated food. But when during the journey they had to be put on short commons, they ate up straps, rope ends, and one another's tails. The four men had provisions for fully three months. While the smoke rose from the crater of Erebus, Shackleton marched southward over snow-covered ice. Sometimes the snow was soft and troublesome, sometimes covered with a hard crust hiding dangerous crevasses in the mass of ice. At the camps, the adventurers set up their two tents and crept into their sleeping bags, while the ponies, covered with horse cloths, stood and slept outside. Sometimes they had to remain stationary for a day or two when snowstorms stopped their progress. When the sun was hidden by clouds, the illumination was perplexing. No shadows revealed the unevenness of the snowfield. All was of the purest white, and where the men thought they were walking over level ground, they might quite unexpectedly come down on their noses down a small slope. Once they heard a thundering noise far away to the east. It sounded like a cannon shot, but probably was only the immense inland ice calving. When the ice, during its constant but slow motion toward the coast, slides out into the sea, it is lifted up by the water and is broken up into huge, heavy blocks and icebergs which float about independently. When these pieces break away, the inland ice is said to calve. Shackleton advanced toward the pole at a rate of 12 to 18 miles a day. His small party was lost like small specks in the endless desert of ice and snow. Only to the west was visible a succession of mountain summits like towers and pinnacles. The men seemed to be marching towards a white wall which they could never reach. On November 31st, one of the ponies was shot, and its flesh was kept to be used as food. The sledge he had drawn was set up on end and propped up as a mark for the return journey. Five days later, Shackleton came to Scott's farthest south, and the lofty mountains with dark, steep, rocky flanks which he afterwards had by the side of his route had never before been seen by man. A couple of days later, a second pony was shot, and shortly afterwards a third, which could go no farther, had to be put out of his misery. The last pony seemed to miss his comrades, but he still struggled on with his sledge while the four men dragged another. The mountain range, which they had hitherto had on their right, curved too much to the east, but fortunately it was cut through by a huge glacier, the great highway to the pole. They ascended the glacier and crossed a small pass between great pillars of granite. Now they were surrounded by lofty mountains. The ice was intersected by dangerous crevasses, and only with the greatest caution and loss of time could they go around them. A bird flew over their heads, probably a gull. What could he be looking for here in the midst of the eternal ice? One day, three of the explorers were drawing their sledge while a fourth was guiding the one drawn by the pony. Suddenly, they saw the animal disappear, actually swallowed up by the ice. A snow bridge had given way under the weight of the pony, and the animal had fallen into a crevasse 1,000 feet deep. When they bent over the edge of the dark chasm, they could not hear a sound below. Fortunately, the front crosspiece of the sledge had come away, so that the sledge and the man were left on the brink of the chasm. If the precious provisions had gone down with the horse into the bowels of the ice, Shackleton would have been obliged to turn back. 
Now, left without assistance in dragging the sledges, they had to struggle up the glacier between rocks and slates in which coal was embedded. On Christmas Day, the temperature was down to minus 47 degrees, a fine midsummer. At length, the four men had left all mountains behind, and now a plateau country of nothing but snow-covered ice stretched before them. But still the surface of the ice rose toward the heart of the South Polar Continent, and the singing headaches from which they suffered were a consequence of the elevation. A flag on a bamboo pole was set up as a landmark. On January 7th and 8th, 1909, they had to lie still in a hard snowstorm, and the temperature fell to minus 69 degrees. When such is the summer of the South Pole, what must the winter be like? January 9th was the last day on their march southwards. Without loads or sledges, they hurried on and halted at 88 degrees, 23 minutes south latitude. They were only 100 miles from the South Pole when they had to turn back from want of provisions. They might have gone on and might have reached the pole, but they would never have come back. The height was more than 10,000 feet above sea level, and before them, in the direction of the pole, extended a boundless, flat plateau of inland ice. The Union Jack was hoisted and a record of their journey deposited in a cylinder. Shackleton cast a last glance over the ice toward the pole and, sore at heart, gave the order to retreat. Happily, he was able to follow his trail back and succeeded in reaching his winter quarters, whence his vessel carried him home again in safety. End of section 24 Read by Stephen Seidel Thank you for listening. End of From Pole to Pole, a book for young people by Sven Heden, translated by Macmillan and Company, Limited.